mean the September 22nd meeting of the Committee of the Whole will come to order and we will have roll call first. Bourne. Here. Falk. Here. Bowers. Here. Welcome back, Tom. Decker. Here. Gisha. Here. Hannah. Excused. Heideman. Here. Koth. Here. Kittleson. Excused. Clayunas. Here. Montemayor. Excused. Rainflesh. I don't know. Okay. I haven't said it, so I'm home. I didn't get home to see it. Surik. Here. Vandewiel. Here. Vu. Here. Wangaman. Here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. All right, we have a quorum. Uh, let's have Pledge of Allegiance, please. Mm -hmm. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, President Bourne. Uh, we will now take a look at the mi minutes from August 18th. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Second. Okay, so moved and seconded to approve the minutes of August 18th. Any discussion? Okay, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Anybody opposed? Okay, minutes are approved. We really only have one thing on the agenda today, which is a big thing, and it's the uh, guiding document for the 2010 budget planning and budget um, development and it um, was discussed or was presented um, as 1149 at uh, last month's, no, uh, no, the first month's, the first council of the September. 1149, um, it explains uh, the resolution, the, the uh, you might say the thought behind it some goals for the, res for the budgeting, and also um, some specific uh, directions for city departments. So what I'd like to do tonight would be to discuss it. Uh, this is um, something that we could amend or we can add to. Uh, but I would like it to be something where everybody who has some questions gets them answered or has uh, some other information to give us, okay? So uh, we will open up the discussion to all the persons, but I also will ask for any input from people who are sitting in the benches if they would like to as well. So um, we'll do as much input as we can. Hopefully this will be taken care of in an hour or so. Alderman Balk. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to add to that uh, intro that this will also be the guiding document. The Salary and Grievance Committee has, uh, has voted and agreed that this document will be, whatever final form it gets approved, will be forwarded on to the uh, Labor Relations uh, bargaining committee, that this will be the guiding document and that it will be their strategy. They, they will not be empowered to negotiate anything except something that is in alignment with this document. So Thank that's a, another important reason why this is, uh, we need to have this conversation. Great. Does anyone, ha everyone have a copy of it? Uh, does anyone need something to refer to? Okay, I think we have one copy up here. Okay. I got some. <coughs> Montemayor, would you like to address the Council? The Committee of the Whole, I should say. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, mm -hmm. My first question is, where exactly are you on the budget process as outlined by the city codes? because uh, I'm gonna read you the very first one. During the month of June each year, <coughs> standing committees of the city shall meet with the appropriate department heads to project goals and objectives and include the ensuing budget year. Okay, that's in June. We have got this document that you just turned in, which is the goals and objectives that was turned in on the 8th of September. Mm -hmm. You're two months late already. Uh the question, maybe um, Terry Hansen, finance director, would you like to answer it from the point of view of operations and uh, why it is later? It is late, later than usual, yes. Yes, the, the
This is later than the ordinance is provided, and the part of that is due to the fact that we have to negotiate the three con or eight contracts this year. All the union contracts are up, and then there was issues with the health insurance that we were trying to figure out what to do with that. So that delayed everything from then on. And then in actuality, we changed, the council voted to change the ordinance to allow the council to adopt the dates that all this stuff will be provided for. And those dates will be presented to the finance committee this upcoming meeting to be forwarded onto the council. Um, from a, just a standpoint of where the staff has been at in working with this is we've received health insurance numbers that we feel pretty solid on right now so we can start moving forward in that regard. Um, negotiation uh, initial meeting was met with, uh, with all of the heads of the unions to discuss some initial ideas and then um, from a perspective of operations the mayor has started again meeting for a second time with all the departments to go over what he would like to see them implement in their budgets that will be coming forward very soon. So we anticipate getting numbers in the next few weeks from the departments and it'll be coming to the council very shortly after that. Are you saying like the month of October? Or are you thinking yes, that is the goal by the end of October to have the executive budget submitted. Okay. And technically that is probably about three weeks later than what you would originally see. So it's a lot of legwork that the departments are putting ahead and condensing a lot of time to get this work done. So it's what was normally allowed a four month process. We're trying to do it in about four to six weeks. Thank you. Okay. See, that's, that's, my, that's my big concern. Mm -hmm. You're not following the process that's really outlined for you. Mm -hmm. If you were gonna change it, you should have changed it back in June. You're just kind of flying by the seat of your pants right now. The um, preliminary budget was due on, on or before August 15th of each year. Each department or board, except for the Board of Education, shall file with finance director, treasurer, an itemized statement of disbursements made to carry out the powers and duties of such departments or board for the preceding physical year, and detailed statement of the receipts and disbursements of accounts and special fund under supervision <coughs> of such department board during each such year. Also, detailed estimates of the same matters the current physical year for the ensuing physical year. Such statements shall be presented in a form prescribed by the city finance director treasurer and shall be designated as a departure estimates. Uh, what I'm saying here is there's nothing in here that says you can delay this because you're going to start negotiating with the labor contracts. None whatsoever. Um, Alderman Gisha, or Vice President Gisha. Thank you. That's why we did an ordinance change, Lee, uh, on the council floor. What is the ordinance yeah, change? I don't have the ordinance in front I of me. I would like a copy of that. If, in please. addition, excuse me, Lee. In addition, I'm sure you can get a copy from Sue Richards. Uh, in addition, uh, Terry's a little bit modest. What has been going on since the last 60 days or longer has been uh, detailed and intricate meetings with each department head and budget sessions <clears throat> where Terry developed a program and plan which each department builds their budget from the ground up rather than in past experiences from the top down. The numbers referenced in that have been, as the ordinance prescribes, uh, uh, it allows the finance director to accept those numbers and have those numbers in the form that he so prescribes. He has been uh, uh, greatly involved with all the ordinance deals with, with those numbers for quite some time. And uh, the department heads also have put in a, a huge amount of work in these work sessions <clears throat> on the budget uh, uh, as prescribed. Okay, that kind of answers some of the questions, but it doesn't answer all of it. Mm -hmm. I still say you're not following the process that you just outlined by our city codes, okay? Do you have something else for me? Um, yes. On this, on this um, handout that's uh, printed out, it, uh, it has a, a bunch of different cities and their budgets and what have you. 
But I believe in our in our in our um, code book, we have a thing that we the comparison tables is only compared to Osh, uh, Oshkosh, La Crosse. I'm trying to remember all of them, where we can only compare ourselves to a certain number of cities. We can't put all of them together and then say we divide that by X number of things and come out with a figure. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, um, uh, Vice President Gisha actually uh, circulated this, so maybe we can have his answer for why that was sent out. Sure, I actually uh, just sent it out as, as background uh, on all the municipalities. There is no uh, code or regulation except from the standpoint of the Human Resources Department in using comparable communities for payroll. That's in our, that is in our, and has been in our pay plan for a number of years um, based on the disposition of the pay plan that's probably in question, but there is no uh, ordinance or actually past practice in determining our city of Sheboygan tax rate by a, uh, by a comparison of just specific communities. There is nothing having to do with the tax at all, anywhere. I understand that, sir. What I'm saying is, in that code book, it tells you when you compare yourself, you can only com you compare yourself to a sick, about six cities. Only on an HR level, not on a budgetary level. Okay. I think that was... Uh... Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Masaya. Uh Alderman uh, Zurek? Thank you, Madam Chair. I may could answer part of Lee's question. Uh, <clears throat> there are nine comparable cities that we do, we've used for arbitration. <clears throat> and <clears throat> the state recognizes them as being like and kind communities. <clears throat> They're not so much in population, but, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, they, as they say, like and kind. And these cities include Beloit, Wausau, Oshkosh, Appleton, La Crosse, Manitowoc, Green Bay, Fond du Lac, and Janesville. And I, I took the figures that were presented in this, this chart here, <clears throat> and I noticed that the summary that we were presented said that we percent, we're eight percent higher than our peer group. Um, if we compare ourselves to our comparables, actually, um, our comparable group is seven point nine four. It's compared to the city being at seven point eight seven. Uh, I would prefer that we look at like and kind cities as opposed to arbitrarily pulling out some cities with like a, a population. So, thank you. If I may. Oh, <coughs> Vice Vice President Kisha. Thank you. Like and kind cities is only used for human resources purposes for the setting of rates. It is never used for the setting of tax rates ever, anywhere, on any one of these cities put all the way through. You don't compare, if that was the case, we'd probably be at 99% uh, human resources cost uh, in this city. But we don't, that comparison is, was in our pay plan. It was in our code and to follow the pay plan. It had nothing to do with tax rate. Zero, zero, nothing, zero. It had only to do with an HR function, which has nothing to do with the tax rate. So combining those two has no, that's like apples and grapefruit. I mean, it's, it, one doesn't have anything to do with the other. <coughs> President Bourne. Thank you, Madam Chair. The other, the, other, the, the other reason why I think it's a good idea that Alderman Gisha picked out these surrounding cities is because, you, I, don't, I don't know if the word competition is the correct word, but maybe it is. These are the cities that we are, we're, uh, we're competing with for, for small businesses to be developed, large businesses to be developed. So these are communities that we are, are in competition with. And so therefore, I think it's probably good we are comparing those. Alderman Bell, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we, we can and will have long, vigorous conversations this fall with our friends in the, uh, the negotiation bargaining units about what we should be paying our employees in those com comparable nine cities. What great point President Bourne and Vice President Gisha have brought up is that that's all well and good, but as we compete for growing the tax base, we are competing with cities who have a 21% lower tax rate for their people. And, uh, and so that is an important element. Our, our friends in the bargaining units may reject that logic completely, 
but they are doing it at the peril of us as a growing city and, and our ability to grow and, uh, and attract businesses that will pay higher taxes to the city. Because again, population of this city in, in, after World War II was in the 48s, 48,000 ish, and now we're 50 ish. We got a great big lake. We're not gaining any more people. And I don't see an appetite for a lot of uh, us sucking up small communities to the south and north of us or to the west of us. So our, our individual family tax base is not going to grow. How are we going to grow the tax base? We bring more business. How can you bring more business when they're going to have to pay 21% higher taxes if they come to our city? They're going to go other places. They're going to go to Plymouth. They're going to go to Port Washington and Trivers, uh, places like that. So thank you, President Bourne, for bringing up that point. It is about competing. And what I like about this set of comparables that Alderman Gisha has put together is um, if we set our budget based on this uh, and our pay is much, much higher with those nine comparables that, uh, uh, that Alderman Sirk mentioned, uh, if our friends in the bargaining unit say, well, we don't care about your budget issues, we want to talk nine comparable cities, well, then that just makes the conversation that much more interesting because our ability to pay, if we stick with this and we believe that our city, ta our taxpayers are overtaxed, uh, putting us in the top 10 or 15 percent of all communities in Wisconsin, if they ignore that fact, then that makes those negotiations much less productive and much more complicated. Sorry to go on so long, but it's an important point. Okay, um, Alderman Sirk first. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll refrain for a minute. Okay. Okay, you don't hold back? Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> um, Alderman Bowers. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, does anybody know what percent these nine cities or even the surrounding cities that are listed in purple uh, pay their employees? Like, we're at 82 percent. Are the, any of these other cities close to that? Or are they higher or lower? I would imagine they're all lower percent of their budget. Does anyone know that? Would it help if I were to get some figures? They it, it would help. It, we'd have to present them to the council on the, not, the, um, in October, October 6th, when we have the meeting, um, as extra information. I, w I was um, just wondering this point, if this would help in, in the bargaining. I don't know. Well, well, it would be you could present it to the bargaining. I'm sure you know as part of the, their information. <coughs> okay. Um, I will try to have those figures okay. for you in the next uh, week or so. Okay. Thank you. Alderman, sir. That kind of begs the point that uh, Alderman Marrow has brought up. I, one of the objectives of this proposal here is that we go from an 85% uh, <coughs> benefit wage level to an 80% level. Uh, how do we fit? I mean, uh, if we did the comparables with the tax rates, if we do the comparable with what the other costs are, the cities there, we are, we are a service organization here, and, and benefits and wages will be a large portion of our, of our revenue. And I'd be curious to know whether maybe there's cities that are at 90%, but I think you'd be curious to find out that information. Thank you. Thank you. Just as a point in the resolution, it says that significant progress be made toward financially sustainable pay benefit goal of 80% or, or less um, of general fund expenditures. It's a, a goal. It's not saying that it will be reached in this budget. So it's a goal. Okay, um, Dulce, Dulce, Dulce Johnson, want to come up to the mic, please? I just have a question about one of the um, goals and objectives. Item three, it says, with neighborhood needs throughout our city, we feel special attention is warranted in increasing inspections and expanding code enforcement. And <clears throat> I support the intent but I wonder about the implementation. I believe under the STAR resolution, one of the building or housing inspectors was let go. I don't know if those are the same people or not. And um, so if, if that's the case, I'm wondering how you're going to do more with less. Can I have some information? Vice President Bishop. Thank you. Uh, excellent question. Uh, an inspector was not released from the building inspection office. An employee in that department oh, was, uh, so the actual guys would go out there. Uh, and uh, Alderman Bourne and I had a meeting with the mayor this morning, and this topic actually was one of them. And uh, I think you will see through his budget process coming forward, 
a plan that mirrors that very item to expand uh, via some, and I don't want to give away his, his thing, but he has addressed it and actually has a, a fairly significant plan uh, that I found compelling and uh, Alderman Bourne maybe would have a different opinion, but uh, I guess more to come. I think it's up to the mayor to probably make that announcement is all I'm saying. Okay, I have a question for uh, Finance Director Hansen. Uh, when you was, uh, <coughs> was described working with the departments, you've been working with them for weeks now. Is this a zero-based budgeting type of process um, or not quite that drastic? It, um, it is not a zero base budgeting. It is, it, it's on its way to that, that type of format. What has been happening is we start off with um, looking at ideas, not numbers, and looking at what the goals and objectives are of each of the departments and where the department should be and look at opportunities that could arise for either more efficiencies gained or um, areas to look at um, providing services that could be charged for to outline communities or whatnot. It all depends on, on exactly what it is. But it, it's pretty much looking at every possible realm of enhancing revenues or cutting costs. And then based upon that, then we, um, the mayor looked at all of it, put it all together, and then um, is meeting with all of the departments again to sit there and say, this is where I want you to target. And then, then they're given the numbers to try to put together their budget to reflect what the mayor's directing them and what he'd like to see accomplished. Okay, thank you. Uh, Alderman Bowers. Uh, thank you, Mayor. This is for uh, Mr. Hansen, too. <laughs> I see that we uh, have a... Uh, a figure here of twenty million nine hundred fifty thousand. I thought our total expenditures were thirty-six million. So could he explain the difference between the thirty-six and the twenty twenty million? Is this a tax levy? The twenty that million. Is the, and the rest levy. comes from the uh, state? state. The state, and then fees charged for services like building inspection permits. Okay, so licenses. this is just for for taxes. The twenty million. Correct. And the that rest is the tax state burden. and uh, fees that we collect from. Uh, other entities. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, Terry, would you Thank you. No. Um, Vice President Gishin. Thank you. Terry, a couple questions, um, I guess, relating specifically to the resolution under the specific guidelines for the 2010 um, budget. If, if you could give us some background on uh, item one as to the effect of item one uh, using a, the tax rate versus the tax levy and what result using the tax rate based on valuations may affect your, the total pot available in the checkbook. Okay. Um, when you s set the tax rate, what you're doing is you're setting what you figure is an allowable rate to tax the residents. And that rate is then applied to the values of the home. So if a $100,000 home and the tax rate is, I think it's around 8.31, I think it's 8.31, is a, this is based on market oh, yeah. value. Right. So, um, so if it's 8.31 and then you multiply that 8.31 times, the, times the, the 100 and then that comes up with $831 that the city would receive from that home. If you, and so if your values increase, then you can anticipate spending more in taxes the following year based on the, the factor on how the property tax structure is set up. The ability to pay is based upon the value of your home, and that could be argued. But um, if your home value goes down or if your business value goes down, then technically you would be paying less in taxes the following year. So you could, um, so basically, it's based on the value. If your value is going up, there's a factor that you more will have a greater ability to pay. Your value goes down, you have less ability to pay. Whereas if you set the tax levy, the levy, the dollar amount itself, you're saying this is the amount of taxes we're going to collect. And if that rate becomes $9 or if it becomes $7, we don't care. We need this amount of money in order to fund our services. 
So that's the big difference is if you want to set it by a dollar amount or if you want to set it by the ability to pay based upon the tax structure that's set up right now. Oh, yes, the follow -up. So based on as it's written currently, uh, that the mayor and the department heads produce a zero tax rate increase for the 2000 and effectively holding the same rate, which is actually reduced last year, the effect on the 2010 levy would be what based on evaluations as you see them? Based upon the value, residential valuations, we have not received the manufacturing valuations yet. Um, there is a slight increase in residential. I think it was like, I'm thinking it was about an $8 million increase, if my memory serves me right. And it all depends upon what the manufacturing comes in at. And if the manufacturing comes in at zero, then we could receive more funds. If the manufacturing comes in at a significant decrease, where we would actually see a drop in our tax base, we could see less revenue. Based upon the, the state has released the equalized values, and, but we haven't received the manufacturing yet. So based on equalized values, but it, it, the tax rate isn't calculated that way. But if we hold everything true, they would say that we would have lost $20 million in manufacturing value. So if that number holds true, this is fiction, kind of a fictional portrait, I guess. But it, if based upon the equalized value, we have a $12 million loss in our tax base. And that would equate to about a $100,000 decrease in the tax revenue. Um, from the, my perspective, that $100,000, I mean, that's, it's up to the council on how to deal with that, but that's a figurative. That is not a definitive number. Mm -hmm. We could lock in on a tax dollar amount, a tax levy, if, if this changes. We could lock in on a dollar amount, and if our value does go up, you don't capture any of that new growth. Yeah. So then, in theory, if there's a new structure that's been built, then the services that they're demanding fall upon the new, the, the other taxpayers, in essence. If I may. Yes, uh, okay. the, uh, so the current model shows a, based on this, a zero tax rate and a roughly a loss of $100,000 in, in overall revenue. That's kind of the model we're, we're looking at at the moment? That's, I would say that's worst case. Worst case, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so I guess you know, 100000 you say it's, people, that's a lot of money, but in the grand scheme of a $36 million budget, it kind of, it is significant in the sense that if it is less, the city would actually be spending less than the year before. Um, if there's an increase in those, though, however, this would capture the, the increase in those services demanded by the increase in properties, et cetera. Correct. Correct. Okay. On a different question based on item three, it was brought up to me by Alderperson Reinflesch uh, regarding the language and how it was worded uh, it currently reads that the capital improvements program resume with a minimum funding slash borrowing level of $2 million for 2010. And uh, I was trying to remember why the language was kind of mushy like that. Um, I think the thought was that if additional dollars were became available, that we could actually bond more than $2 million, but we want to make sure there was a floor of no less than two million to give some flexibility to your department and to the mayor in this final uh, CIP portion of the budget. Does that, uh, as the language read now, give that type of flexibility? Your thoughts, basically, on that? Yeah, that's that's how I I recall it, it developing and what was being discussed. There is based upon I think it's ordinance, or is it a resolution that restricts it to $3 million for general capital improvements anyways. Mm -hmm. So there is a cap of $3 million set by another resolution, and then this was to set that floor so that there was a minimum funding level for infrastructure. I think that was partially forth. because last year was zero. Correct. Because of the budget issues that came up. Yeah, we did see, I think, about 800000 yeah. for a project. So That's water. right. Uh, President Warren. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Terry, I've got a question uh, as far as property tax 
uh, and the value of properties. Uh, we've got a couple companies that are going to be leaving Sheboygan. Pentair is done at the end of September, and next year it's going to be Thomas Industries. Uh, do we collect the same amount of property taxes on those buildings if they're if they're vacant and they're not doing anything compared to when they've got an active business going? And what could be the potential effect there? Um, that would be a good question for Dave Lutsky, the assessor. But um, I would anticipate, just based upon what you see, I would anticipate a drop in some value, but there is still a value in that structure being there. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not like it goes to zero. Right. But th I believe that there is a reduced portion in that. So we, we would possibly see a reduction. And from an earlier presentation, I think Dave Lutsky projected that we would have a, a tax base a tax base decrease the following year. So I think he was projecting that that would occur. Okay, thank you. Uh, Alder, Alderman Bowers. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, I talked with the assessor and I asked the same question and he said it would take two to three years before the uh, state would catch up with devaluation so he didn't expect too much of a decrease this year, but we don't know what was in the, in the channel other years. So uh, with Pentair and Thomas Industry, uh, he didn't expect any decrease right away. Alderman Bell. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And state shared revenue estimates, I know it's hazy and you kind of make it up, but what's the estimate? Minus well, a couple of hundred thousand? Or? And we, we actually received confirmation on what it's going to be for 2010, and it was an additional $106,000 less because expenditure restraint went down as well, too. As more cities are participating in the program, there's less money going into the pie, so there's less to be split out. So we have a total decrease of um, $336,000 in, in aid. Wow, okay, so as a follow-up, Madam Chair, so just the big chunks of money, there's 336,000 less in state shared revenue. There's about 100,000, worst case, $100,000 decrease uh, due to property, uh, property values decreasing. And then we'll have to come up with 140 dollars to $180,000 in bond payments if we do two to $3 million worth of uh, infrastructure enhancements. So just back of the napkin, that's six, seven hundred thousand dollars right there in immediate impact. So I mean, there's no doubt we're going to be spending ne less next year. And the way that impacts is the document we're talking about tonight uh, under the the second top of the second page. Those five kind of goals and objectives. The first one being um, pay and benefits will begin a march downward. Um, so if we take in a lot less money. Uh, as we begin our conversations, our negotiation conversations, the, uh, the collective bargaining unit will not be empowered to bring the salary and grievance committee back something that would march that percentage north of 85 or 86. So again, it's going to be very, very difficult because um, if our, our, our total pot of money is decreasing significantly by seven or $800,000 and we are tasking the negotiations committee to bring back pay and benefit goal that is somewhat less than 85% of the total pot of money, those are gonna be some difficult conversations. And I just want, as we, as we move toward next Monday night or two Mondays from now and we vote to approve this document, I'd like to go through the five sentences here and how that impacts negotiations. And that's, so number one, that's how it affects it. Uh, is that it's going to be a very difficult conversation because less money and we're going to drive that percentage down. Thank you, Madam Chair. Is there anything about the wording itself in the document because it'll be coming before the council as a document to be approved and um, this is our working time on it. Is there anything that people want to say or do about with it? Okay. Is there? I would, I would, Madam Chair. I just, I'm not sure my light is. Yeah. Not yes, beeping. it's still on. Uh, thank you. Uh, I guess I'd go to the next item then under uh, the savings of three uh, percent. If uh, Chairman Gisha could talk about one of the one of the thoughts that's out there, uh, Chairman Gisha, is that um, the uh, because of the signing of the Wisconsin budget, fire and police are immune, if you will, from any budget cuts. And what I read in number two is that we expect this saving. So can you explain what you've learned as chairman and what you and the mayor have learned through his training, how we can get some savings out of fire and police potentially, even though the Wisconsin budget is what it is, please. Yes. Thank you. Um, I think I might. 
uh, I say I think because the Department of uh, Revenue, who was charged and not happy about being charged, by the way, with putting this program together, setting litmus tests, setting forms, setting everything, um, in speaking to them over uh, many hours, um, here's how, I guess, where it is, a snapshot of the moment. They had a, uh, a communication period where they solicited back from municipalities and so forth that was supposed to end on the 12th, if I recall, Terry? It got extended. The 18th. That was extended because of the wave of what the heck are you doing kind of comments. Um, I, uh, I reviewed, and I know Terry did, and, and uh, the finance department, finance committee reviewed the, uh, the communications from not only the Wisconsin League of Municipalities, but the Counties Association, as well as other uh, entities who were asked to weigh in on this. And the urge and the, right now the momentum is that the rules to, are to be written, or, or, or very well could be written, allowing for the percent of shared revenues as a percent of your total budget to not be able to be touched for fire and police. For instance, if we spend a dollar for a policeman or a fireman, who says that dollar doesn't come from our, our, uh, our general tax levy versus the same dollar coming from the state of Wisconsin? And that's kind of the quandary that the Department of Revenue is in right now. How do they do that? They initially sent out a form that looked rather not friendly to municipalities that would have done just as was originally feared, locked it in. They seem to be softening on that point. Also, the Department of Revenue will have a, um, they don't know in what form, shape, or who is on it, but they will have a process in which, let me give you an example. If we had um, a substantial amount of top-end retirements, such as we had in the police department, of which we recaptured some of those savings, done in the fire department, we should be able to, through potentially reorganization, have less seats to fill if we reorganize it or if that's the way it comes down. Uh, and I had that specific conversation with the head of the DOR who was writing these rules and he said that would be a case where you would be able to substantiate why you're doing it and why it makes sense. They're looking for trap doors all the way around this because they don't want to be sitting through uh, every community in the state of Wisconsin every time they want to cut $10 for co free coffee or something. So um, the, the rules seem to be softening up and we're looking forward to a ruling by the next couple of weeks, Terry, uh, that gives us the latitude to determine dollar that is or by percentage based on the percent of shared revenue we get versus tax, local tax dollars. So I don't know, that's a kind of a long answer that doesn't give you a lot, but that's the way the pendulum seems to be swinging the other way now. Alderman Bell. Thanks. Just a follow up, Madam Chair. So, as, a, as guidance to the uh, labor negotiations collective bargaining team, that, that, that there's no mandate from the state that fire department bu manning budgets and police department manning budgets go untouched, that those are up for grabs, and that there are ways financially to uh, make a case for making those very efficient organizations in accordance with our second bullet, which is we expect a, a savings of 3%. Is that a fair way to put it? I guess I would couch it as even if there was a mandate, there's a process to, to, uh, to gain those financial efficiencies through the review process with the Department of Revenue. So worst case scenario is we have a scenario kind of like we discussed and that the Department of Revenue uh, would, through their waiver process, just say, yeah, we get that, we understand that, and move on. So I think both ways, one is setting the rules as we described it with percentage uh, would be great, would be the best. It, the other would be for us to have to make a clear case why we'd be spending less based on common sense. Now, you're dealing with the state of Wisconsin, so common sense doesn't always enter into it, but um, that seems to be the two sides of it, and we'll probably end up living somewhere in the middle um, with some relief. President Bourne. Thank you. Using, using, the, uh, using the fire department as an example, a question that I want answered is, let's say, for example, we had 
five retirements. I know we're, we know we're going to have the chief, and let's say we have four other retirements <coughs> in the fire department. And let's assume that there's no change in the table of organization. We rehire five people. But those five people, the, chief, chief, the new chief might come in as a lesser salary than the, the chief we have now, and then let's assume the other four people come in as, at less salaries. And let's say at the end of the day, because of less salaries, we have a savings, let's say, of $150,000. The question I want to answer from the Department of Revenue, are we going to be able to take $50,000 savings and put that back in the general fund, or is this maintenance of efforts going to say you're going to save $150,000, but you're going to have to set, you're going to have to keep it in the department and, and and spend it somewhere else? And that's that's one thing that I want answered is if we do have savings, are we going to put it in the general fund? That's the way I'd like to see it, but that hasn't been clarified yet either. I think one of the things in terms of this budget process being uh, slower is the fact that the state keeps sending out new things and or giving you hints of things, but nothing's definite. And this um, maintenance of effort is one example of that. That has been we knew about it, I think, in June, but as to what it really meant and who was responsible, that has taken all summer to do, and um, that's a hard thing to plan for when the, the sands are shifting under everybody's budget from, from month to month or week to week. So, um, and uh, Terry's, Mr. Hansen's trying to do the best he can to keep us up to date and to bring up things that uh, influence our, our calculating and our planning. Anything else? Yes, Please. Lee Montemayor. <laughs> I know you said that that the population of the city doesn't have anything to do with the, the financial uh, budget part of it. It's strictly used for a chart type things, okay? But you know, in 2007, the estimate, the census estimate, was 48,598. That's in 2007. I doubt very seriously we're at that point now. We probably back to the 1960s, probably about 45,000 people, I would think. Uh, we're, we're going to have a sense that we'll find out for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing that, that brings this up is, yes, the population does make a difference because, you know, when we compare ourselves to different communities like La Crosse, Oshkosh, uh, Eau Claire, these are all college towns. They have more students that come in, like an like example is Oshkosh. They have 11,000 students. Of course, they need more policemen. Okay, same thing with Eau Claire. Uh, just thing. So I would think this would make a difference in what your budget is because what are you going to have a hiring freeze if you have a, a bunch of retirements in here? What would you do then? Mm -hmm. Okay, we don't happen to have that kind of students that come into this city. Yes, Vice, Vice President Gishel. Thank you. Uh, Lee, I, I'm sure you, you understand those students aren't counted in population. Yeah, but those communities such as La Crosse, and I don't think you want to look at La Crosse's tax rate as an example, those communities receive, in the case of La Crosse, it's just slightly over $1 million from the University of Wisconsin system for that increased police protection, fire protection, even trucks and, um, and capital expenses. So while they may have these universities, they are compensated for them. I understand that, sir. So that but makes a big difference. Yeah, right, it does. Yeah, yes. and, those, and by the way, they still have some of the highest tax rates in the state. Yes, that's correct. They also have a, a higher TO in those cities, big time. So that eats up that $1 million Absolutely. in a big hurry. Absolutely. I think they have over 100 firemen. Ooh. No, I don't know about 100. I know that uh, this is a 2002 police TO. They have 97. Gosh, gosh, that's 97. Madison's has 382, <laughs> yeah. if you want to go a little further. Uh, Eau Claire has 99. Uh, this is, this, these are old figures here. Uh, Sheboygan, and, and at, the, we're at this thing, we're at 52,000, which I told you uh, the census is 48. Right. We have, at this time, at that time, was 90. I think we're, we haven't filled three of the positions, so we're below the 90 figure. Now, these are old figures, it says. Thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, is there any um, motion, resolution, anything on, on the table right now? Alderman Bulk. Um, I just want to continue down the list. Madam Chair, just with number three, I appreciate uh, Dulce Johnson mentioning number three. We think that more inspections and better code enforcement, we think better code enforcement will lead to better neighbors, uh, better law enforcement, and higher property values. So that's uh, what I think number three is about. Number four, I guess I'd ask either Director Hansen or Chairman Gisha to talk about the history of those fund balances, why number four is written in here, and what we hope the future of fund balances looks like as we move into 2010. Thank you. Yes. Director Hansen, please. The, the use of fund balance, since I, I've been here in 08, I think it was budgeted around 500,000 last year. It was budgeted, I think, 750 or, or something around that mark. And the thought behind the fund balance is that you'll have retirements and then you'll have new ones coming, new employees coming in, and so you get an attrition savings and that it was kind of budgeted in. And so that, that was why it was done the way it was. Um, my, my personal belief is that if we can try to stay that back and keep it as close to zero or use it for one-time expenditures, that that's a bet it will set the city up in a better position in the long run, <laughs> that you're not reliant on one-time type of expenditures or savings to operate your, your municipality. That if you can set it up for recurring revenues, cover recurring expenditures, that that's ultimately, in my view, the, the best way to, to set it up. So I think that that um, was addressed because I made that comment in a finance committee mm -hmm. meeting mm -hmm. that ideally we'd like to see that get to that point and it was incorporated into this document. Bring up a happy note? Yes. Vice President Gisha. We've been talking a lot of doom and gloom uh, numbers and st stuff, but uh, I guess as, as uh, Alderman Bauck is moving forward, item five, I think, is a real positive for our employees. Um, as a goal, goal and objective of a formal training program to increase employee skill sets. Um, I know, Alderman Bach, that's kind of your role. I mean, that's one of your, your things at Johnsonville to do that. But even on my little teeny level, um, I'm evaluated every year on how I've made myself more valuable to the company with training and reaching out and learning new things. I think uh, by challenging our employees and providing them the tools um, to, better, to be better employees and be better people. We all are better when we learn stuff. And I know LTC has offered to help us with this. And I think it's uh, via the mayor, one of the goals for whoever will be our new HR director. But you have a lot more experience regarding employee development than I. Perhaps you could speak to number five as to the value to an organization. Alderman Bell. Uh, I was just going to say that as we go through these tough times, uh, the only thing you can take with you, we talk about it at our company, that you know, the owner can't promise you a job tomorrow. There are a lot of reasons you know, why we always plan like we could shut the doors tomorrow. But in development, uh, Alderman Gisha, the thing is, as these employees invest in themselves, uh, as we give some money for content from classes, whatever their development needs are, that's something nobody can ever take away from them. If, if budget necessities mean we get rid of 20 more employees from somewhere throughout the city, we can't promise them a job tomorrow, but what we can promise them is any development that's given them, computer skills, professional skills that don't have to do with their day-to-day -day job that develop them, leadership opportunities that they're given so that on their resume they can say, managed six others, things of that nature. No one can ever take that away from them. That enhances their own personal value. And as I understand it, in years past, we've had training dollars available um, and that members, uh, city employees haven't maybe taken advantage of it as much as perhaps they hopefully will in the future because hopefully they'll see that as the taxpayers investing in, in them and the city investing in them to make them able to contribute more to the bottom line of the city so that they can find efficiency, so that they can make processes better, so that they can find savings deeply rooted in their budgets. So my hope is that this new HR manager will talk about what those, will develop those programs and that the department heads will manage which employees need what content for their own personal development. It's a really exciting part of this document. And with that, Madam Chair, I would move that we approve the document as written. 
a motion to approve the document as, as it appears. Or, or I'd modify that, that we recommend approval to the yes, Common Council the, as written. Yeah. Right. right. Thank you. To make the motion, we move. You second? second? Yeah. Okay. It's been moved and seconded to move this on to Council meeting October 6th. Any discussion? Alderman Sir. Thank you, Madam Chair. I still would like to have, uh, I know we're going to vote on it today, but I, I would still like to have some figures as to where we sit in terms of benefit for, versus uh, benefit employee salaries versus revenues. I think that's an important figure. It's, it is a goal here, and it says that the goal is to get 80% 80, 80 less of general fund expenditures. Mm -hmm. So apparently we're looking for, for more than 80%. And that, for that reason, I'd like to see this, at least to get those information. Thank you. Okay. Uh, who would who would get that information? Mr. Hanson. Mr. Hanson, can you get that? Uh, where we are in terms of the percentage of uh, the budget is for employees? Yeah, we'll have the finance department work on that. Okay, thank you. Okay, so the current one, whatever it is. Is that something, Madam Chair? Is mm -hmm. that something that you we could have before the uh, you know uh, thirteen days from now, so that we could? Okay, thank you. Okay. If I may. Yes, Vice President Gisha. Thank you. I just want to, um, at this juncture, thank the Finance Committee for, uh, and the Finance Department, and the aldermen and citizens who showed up at the various finance meetings in which we had workshops and discussions regarding this. Um, I mean, I could go right on down the line. I won't, but items such as uh, investing in our community with the code enforcement and stuff, the older person, Clyunis, was instrumental in bringing that to our attention uh, uh, as as a real need um, the, uh, the the tax rate information was kind of universal um, the capital improvements uh, Alderman Bourne and an older person Heidemann were talking at great length about about those so we tried to take all this stuff and incorporate it into a document that becomes somewhat of a living document that we can refer to all year rather than just our usual two lines or one paragraph regarding the budget. And it does say under the heading of 2001 City of Sheboygan budget resolution, standing with our citizens and looking beyond tomorrow. And that's the purpose of this document with big goals and objectives and specifics so that we can refer back to it as we make decisions all year long. Does it fit with our goals and objectives that we set up for the year? Does it fit in finan not just financially, but in our our mission and vision and values in those five items above those objectives. So I just wanted to thank everybody for their input. I think I retyped this five or six times and forced everybody to <laughs> read them over and over, but hopefully we got to a document that was, and maybe other members of the committee who participated, that represents the flavor of our discussions uh, uh, accurately. So I just wanted to thank everybody who participated uh, in the discussions for their help. Okay. It's been moved and seconded to pass this along to the Common Council. Um, uh, all those, do we take a, um, do we take a? Would you like to? Yeah, yeah sure. Take a, for the a record. person to person, for the okay, record. individual vote on this. Okay, we'll call a roll on this. So a yes would be to pass this along. Um, Alderman Bowers, you have something first? Thank you, ma'am, Chairman. Um, could, by passing this tonight, Will there be room for uh, amendments in the, in the council uh, when, it, when they come before? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. At this point, we don't have any, but there may be something based on some information. Okay. Mm -hmm. <coughs> okay. Would you call them up, please? Certainly. Bourne? Aye. Bauk? Aye. Bowers? Aye. Decker? Aye. Gisha votes aye. Hannah is excused. Heidemann. Aye. Koff. Aye. Kittleson is excused. Clyunis. Aye. Montemayor and Reinflesch excused. Zurich. Aye. Vanderweel. Aye. Vu. Aye. And Wanda. Aye. Unanimous. Okay. It's unanimous that uh, we will pass this along to the council. There are 12 people present tonight, so uh, we do have a quorum. And I think that's all that we have on the agenda. Motion to adjourn. Second. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. We are adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.